ladies and gentlemen of the jury. On June 29, 2015, Teresa Seavers is found on her kitchen floor, dead. A pool of blood surrounds her head. She is cold to the touch. It will later be determined that there are 17 impact wounds to her skull, and some are so severe that in one part of her skull, the brain is oozing out. There is a hinge fracture from one side of her skull to the other. This is a brutal murder. Members of the Lee County Sheriff's Office will respond to 27034 Jarvis Road, the residence of Teresa Seavers. And shortly thereafter, crime personnel will respond and will be there for almost a week. Detectives will conduct neighborhood canvases, a line search with almost 30 people walking within arm's length of each other, slowly, will be conducted up streets and down, looking for any possible weapon or any item with blood. Nothing will be found. Initially, there will be no evidence that leads to any suspects of this brutal crime. A brutal murder and nothing taken from the home. A brutal murder and no trail, no ties to any suspects. It will take time, some of the latest technology, long hours, perseverance by law enforcement to solve the mystery of why Teresa Seavers was murdered and who murdered her. And the evidence will establish that Mark Seavers, her husband, arranged for this murder and agreed to pay money for this murder out of the life insurance policies that would become due upon her death. And Curtis Wainwright and Jimmy Rogers would travel from Missouri to Florida and would murder Teresa Seavers. <coughs> what is the evidence? Let's start two months before this murder with a text message sent by Mark Seavers to a friend who lived 1,100 miles away. April 29, 2015. On April 29, 2015, Mark Seavers would text Curtis Wayne Wright, his friend who lived over 1,100 miles away, and the text would read, hopefully we can talk privately tomorrow, not about you or Angie, but it's personal. And the next day, Mark Seavers flies to Missouri to stand by the side of his lifelong friend, Wayne Wright, when he marries his sweetheart, Angie. During the wedding, both the night before and the day of the wedding, Mark Seavers will explain to Wayne Wright what he meant by that text message April 29th, just a few days before. He needs a favor. And on the evening of May 1st, Mark Seavers requests some private time. Over the next 24 hours, he will confide to Wayne Wright that Teresa Seavers is leaving him. 
Mark Seavers will ultimately ask the friend he has stood by in the tough times, including when Wayne Wright was incarcerated. Mark Seavers will ask Wayne Wright to murder Teresa, his wife. And what he asks takes Wayne Wright by surprise. Seavers will discuss the need to be careful, the need to make sure that nothing ties him, Seavers, to the crime, the need to use phones that cannot be linked to each other. And then, after the wedding, Mark Seavers returns back to his residence off Jarvis Road. And two days later, he purchases airline tickets for he, Teresa Seavers, and their two daughters to travel to Connecticut to celebrate Teresa Seavers' mother's birthday. He will book the tickets so that Teresa Seavers returns June 28th, late on a Sunday night, and he and the girls will return Wednesday, July 1st. Two days after booking those plane tickets, two days after booking tickets that have Teresa Seavers flying home alone on June 28th, Mark Seavers will purchase a prepaid anonymous phone at a Walmart in Naples where it will activate and ping off the closest tower to that Walmart and where two minutes later his personal cell phone will ping off of the same tower. And he will send a message to Wayne Wright which says, quote, mailing out today four exclamation points. Call me. It's very simple. Thirteen minutes later, he will send a second text to Wayne Wright. It will say, since neither of us are likely to carry both with us, whenever you want to use the other one, just text me, quote, other, close quote, and then when I can, I will call. May 9th, two days after purchasing the burner phone, Mark Sievers will text, write, and say, did you get mail? And a week later, on May 17th, Wayne Wright will purchase a burner phone and will text Mark Sievers, check other. One and a half hours later, Mark Sievers will reply, Hello, brother, from a, quote, other mother. And the burner phone communications between Mark Seavers and Curtis Wayne Wright begin May 17th, May 21st, May 22nd, June 22nd, June 23rd, June 25th three days after the last burner phone communication between Mark Seavers and Wayne Wright, Teresa Seavers will be dead. Wright and Rogers will have traveled to Florida from Missouri. They will have murdered Teresa Seavers and they will be out of the state on their way back to Missouri before Teresa Seavers' body is even found. How did this come to light? Why this murder? And how do we know now what we do know? Like a puzzle with hundreds of pieces, or maybe a thousand pieces, one piece at a time, one corner put together at a time, two pieces connected. And like a puzzle, the initial pieces placed on the board don't seem to connect to each other. They seem to have no visual connection. It took time. And like a puzzle, or a board with a puzzle that gets knocked, 
Sometimes the pieces had to be picked back up or rearranged back on the board. Perhaps the first piece placed in the puzzle was a Cellbrite download of Mark Seaver's personal cell phone. But it would take a number of weeks into the investigation with the review of that download before a red flag would be raised. The first piece on the board would come on July 9th. 12 days after the murder. And it would come from a call from a chief of police in Illinois, a Port Authority chief of police, who called. The second piece out of the box would come the next day, when detectives from the Lee County Sheriff's Office would fly out to Illinois. They would fly out to briefly speak to someone and they would end up staying 12 days. They would learn of a name that had been given to, they would learn of a name that they had not seen before of any significance. Curtis Wayne Wright, he wasn't on their radar. The information received would lead to a search warrant of the residence of Curtis Wayne Wright and the seizure of a Garmin and a cell phone. It would take some time before the significance of either of those became apparent. However, those few individual pieces would ultimately lead to the viewing of some of the hundreds of videos that were collected just in case, to requesting tower dump information from two cell phone towers, to more search warrants in Missouri, to a girlfriend providing information, to broken phone pieces and blue coveralls that were found on the side of remote roads in Missouri, to fibers on those coveralls found that would be linked to fibers that were found on a tape lift from Teresa Seaver's leg to going back seven weeks before the murder to a Walmart off Juliet Road in Naples that would lead to additional phone records being requested, that would lead to two burner phones, that would lead, and so on, and so on. Much like a puzzle, the pieces were not connected in a neat order, but almost what from the outside might look random or chaotic, but a picture began to emerge. So let's drop in in that puzzle, not as it was first being put together with initial pieces, but in the middle. Let's drop in seven or eight months after this murder. Let's go to January and February of 2016 where some of those pieces that were collected in July and August are taken out of the puzzle box and now closely examined. For this is a case in which 21st century technology became vital. Cell towers, cell tower dumps, call detail records, software programs like Cellhawk and Cellbright that allowed massive amounts of data to be sorted organized and searched. Where the technology behind our phones that allow communication, where that technology became so important. And to understand the significance of what was found in 2016, we must first learn of the significance of or understand the technology of cell phones. Every time an app updates. Every time we make a phone call, every time a text message is sent, every time we Snapchat, every single communication pings off of a cell tower. Multiple companies use individual cell towers. 
but each time we use a cell phone, that communication pings off of a cell tower. It is then recorded and then forwarded to where it's being sent. And all of that occurs in the blink of an eye. But every single communication pings off of a cell tower. If there are no cell towers in an area, there, are no, there can be no cell phone communication. Now, we can use our cell phone and play games on it. But unless there is a cell tower in an area, cell phones cannot communicate because every single communication pings off of a cell tower. And each provider records the numbers for, the, for its phones that are pinging off a cell tower. I mean, cell phones aren't free. And uh, accurate use information is necessary for billing. So every communication is recorded. Now, in a cell tower dump, which is when all the information is taken off a cell tower for a period of time, in a cell tower dump, if you want every phone number that made any communication during a period of time, you must ask for every carrier provider, whether it's AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, you must ask for all of their records because each carrier records the numbers for its particular phones. Tower record information contains numbers. It does not contain voice messages. It does not record communications. It does not record text messages. There's no copy of a Snapchat. It is simply the numbers that are recorded. And there may be what is called an IME number, the direction from which the call was received. But it is all numbers that are recorded. Without an actual phone, text messages are not retrievable. Without an actual phone, any type of communication is not retrievable. It is simply the numbers communicating with each number that is retrievable from a cell tower. In 2015, the cell tower that was nearest to Jarvis Road, during the period of time from when Teresa Seaver's phone, as she was driving home from the airport, connected to the Wi-Fi, and her body was found about 10 hours later, in that period of time, over 98,000 numbers were recorded on that cell tower. 98,000 numbers. Finding an unknown number is like finding that needle in a haystack. And while many cell phones are connected to a name, including prepaid phones, which may be connected to somebody's email address or connected to uh, a physical address. Some prepaid phones, they're often called burner phones, are not connected to any name or to any user. So let's start with that tower dump on Jarvis Road, June 28th to 29th, that time period right around the murder of Teresa Sievers. A tower dump that was requested in August of 2015 for that time period, and when it was collected, there was no sense of whether or where it might fit in. But now in January, February of 2016, perhaps that tower dump might provide information. So how does the Lee County Sheriff's Office or any analyst sit there and review 98,000 pages of numbers. They do it with 21st century technology. And for the Lee County Sheriff's Office, it was a program called CellHawk that allows an analyst to upload thousands of pages and thousands and thousands of numbers and then sort that information into a variety of fashions, <coughs> including area codes, and then allows information to be displayed in graph or in map form. Myra Simmons, an analyst 
for the Lee County Sheriff's Office, was asked by detectives to focus on two states' area codes, Georgia and California. Now, why did Detective Downs ask her to focus on Georgia and California area codes? Because in 2016, in January, Detective Downs had learned from Wright that he had purchased a burner phone with a Georgia area code. He didn't remember the phone number, and the phone had been destroyed in the water of a car wash. And why California? Detective Downs, using a gut guess, picks California. When prepaid pre phones are purchased, where you purchase them does not determine the area code or state of that phone. When you purchase a prepaid phone, the purchaser can decide which state's area code will be attached to the phone. So Myra Simmons went and pulled the area codes for those two states, for Georgia and for California. She found that Georgia had about nine area codes and California over 30, I think about 35 area codes. She then uploaded the thousands of pages of AT&T records from the cell tower dump. Why AT&T? You have to start somewhere with some provider. And Mark Seavers and Wayne Wright, both of their personal cells were AT&T. So Myra Simmons picked AT&T. Uh, I mean, not AT&T, she picked, um, well, she picked AT&T. She started with Georgia because it was the closest state. I suspect because it had less numbers, too. But she started with Georgia, the closest state, and she put, and she did a search for Georgia area code. And the first search she ran, nothing came up. She ran in a few searches, and when she put in a search for the area code 404, a Georgia area code, a number popped. And that 404 number had pinged off of the cell tower near Jarvis Road at 11.37 p.m., the night of the murder. So with that number in hand, she then uploaded the cell tower information from the Chapel Hill Tower in Missouri, another cell tower dump set of information that had been obtained in August. She then uploaded that, and the date for that tower dump was May 17th. Why May 17th? Because detectives, in looking through the text messages of Mark Seavers, had seen text messages that they found concerning on May 17th. So when they did their request for tower dump records, they picked May 17th. She uploaded those tower records, and what did she find? That the same 404 number that she had seen in the Jarvis Road tower dump the night of the murder was also on the Chapel Hill tower dump from May 17th. And what's significant about the Chapel Hill tower dump? That tower is near Curtis Wainwright's residence and in fact can be seen from his residence. At this point, she observed the IMEI numbers from those two tower dumps for the 404 number. Now, what is an IME number? An IME number is like a serial number or a VIN number on a car. Every physical phone is given an IME number. And what she saw was that the phone that pinged off of Jarvis Road on June 28th at 11.37 p.m. had the same IMEI number as the phone that pinged off of the Chapel Hill Tower on May 17th. 
and that told her that that same physical phone had both been in Missouri on May 17th and had been in Southwest Florida on June 28th. With that information, she requested detectives to obtain the phone records for the 404 number, because remember, all you get are numbers from a tower dump. So she requested detectives to obtain the phone records for the 404 number. And when those records were received, she examined the call log from those records. And she found a California area code on those call records. And with that California area code, she then requested detectives to obtain the phone records for that particular California area code. It was an 858 area code. With the phone records for both the 404 number from Georgia, the Georgia area code, and the 858 number from California, she learned that neither number had a person's name associated with it. Both phones were what we often refer to as burner phones. Further, the call detail records for those two numbers showed a very interesting pattern and an interwoven connection. Both were active for a short period of time, having been activated in May. Both communicated primarily with each other, and both stopped being used the summer of 2015. But there was more. The burner numbers 404, the burner phone for 404, and the one for 858 appeared to have a connection between the personal cell phones of Mr. Wright and Mr. Seavers. How so? From May 17th to June 25th, the 404 burner phone number pinged off the same tower and around the same time as Curtis Wayne Wright's personal cell phone. And from May 7th to June 25th, the 858 burner phone number pinged off the same tower and around the same time as Mark Seaver's personal cell phone. And to only strengthen the ties between the Mark Seaver's personal cell phone and the 858 burner phone, when phone records were obtained for the 858 number, it was determined that it was purchased on May 7th at the Walmart on Juliet Road in Naples. It was activated on a cell tower near that Walmart, and within two minutes of that activation, the personal cell of Mark Seavers pinged off of the same tower. Finally, every time the 858 number pinged off a tower, every time, Mark Seavers' personal cell pinged off of that same tower. Tower. As Meyer Simmons will say, they laid their head on the same pillow. In solving this brutal crime, there were many other puzzle pieces. Some focused on Mark Seavers, some focused on those who carried out the murder. Many of those will be introduced during this trial. What are a few? of the other puzzle pieces. Coded messages between Wright and Seavers on their personal cell phones, discovered by law enforcement when reading thousands of pages of phone records. A shredded life insurance policy in Mark Seavers' office. Life insurance policies on Teresa Seavers' death totaling around $5 million physical evidence, like the blue coveralls, like a broken cell phone, 
like actual cell phones and extracts. FBI analysis and analysts that, with the latest equipment and amazing resources, provided the link between small, microsco almost microscopic fibers found on Teresa Seaver's leg in the kitchen floor and in the rental car driven by Wright and Rogers. Fibers that connected to overalls found, thrown away on a rural road in Missouri. FBI analysis that would link a broken piece of hair, no bigger than the width of a nickel, to Rogers. A GPS seized pursuant to the search warrant of Curtis Wainwright's residence back in July of 2015. Well, because of the ability of the digital forensics unit at the Lee County Sheriff's Office, they were able to retrieve overwritten and deleted information which showed, from that garment, which showed a trip to Jarvis Road the weekend of the murder, as well as a trip to a Walmart and various gas stations. And those videos that were collected that now could be viewed in a context, the video from the Walmart would show Rogers and Wright walking in the Walmart the morning the murder was committed. A Walmart on Six Mile Cypress Road, a Walmart right here in this community. And they would show Rogers and Wright a few hours after the murder entering a gas station just a few hours north. And Wright, admitting to law enforcement his involvement, and Curtis Wayne Wright providing the why for a brutal murder where nothing was taken. During this trial, you will hear from many witnesses. But for day, today, let's just discuss Curtis Wayne Wright, the person Mark Seavers asked to murder his wife. Because Wright allows us to go behind the phone records and the text messages, the cell towers and the burner phones, the GPS tracking devices and the life insurance policies, the natural conclusions that may be reached when a brutal crime has occurred, and there is no apparent benefit to those who committed it. And Curtis Wainwright allows us to hear the conversations that occurred between he and Mark Seavers to hear how Mark Seavers solicited, conspired, and arranged the murder of Teresa Seavers. Initially, Wright even denied traveling to Fort Myers. He was protecting himself, he was protecting Rogers, he was protecting Mark Seavers. But eventually he did provide statements to law enforcement about how this murder occurred what his role was, what Roger's role was, what Mark Seaver's role was. He has entered a plea to second degree murder in exchange for providing truthful testimony. And he'll be sentenced for his role in the crime at a later date. You will learn from him that he and Mark Seavers met in high school and have been good friends ever since. They've been through a lot over the years. They could tell each other anything, and at times they did. They were there for each other in the good times and the not so good times. Wright attended Mark Seavers' wedding to Teresa Seavers, and while over the course of Mark Seavers and Teresa Seavers' marriage, Wright would only see Teresa Seavers a few times, he would continue to see Mark, and often Mark would come to Missouri with his daughters. When Mark Seavers needed help with medical, the medical practice computers, for, doctor, for Teresa Seavers was a doctor, and he worked with the office, 
When Mark Seavers needed help with those medical practice computers, he called Wright. And initially, Wright helped out his friend for free. Wayne Wright was on disability and struggling to make ends meet. But when Mark Seavers needed something, Wayne Wright would help. At the wedding, Mark Seavers told Wayne Wright he needed to have Teresa Seavers killed, and that left Wright uncomfortable. But Seavers was his best friend. And his best friend was telling him he was desperate. His best friend was pulling at his heartstrings, saying that he would lose the girls and that his girls, Seavers' girls, would be in danger. And Wayne Wright said he would see what he could do. During those conversations, Mark Seavers made clear there was a lot of insurance money, and he would pay Wayne Wright over 100000 or more to murder Teresa Seavers. Mark Seavers knew of Wayne Wright's precarious finances. On May 17th, after Jimmy Rogers agreed to help, the serious planning began. Mark Seavers picked the time, a time when he and the girls would be out of town, the perfect alibi. And this seemed a little problematic for Wright because he had been planning a trip down to help change over the server that needed to be changed over for the medical practice. But, and he told people about this, but Mark Seavers was in the driver's seat. And how could this ever get traced to Missouri? I mean, you drive to Florida, there are no airline records. You pay cash for gas, there's no credit card bills. You use burner phones, there's no communication between you. How would this ever get traced back to Wright? As we spoke earlier, it was a chance phone call from Illinois, a leave no stone unturned in an investigation that led two detectives to go out to interview a person, a person who'd overheard a brief conversation June 27th. And an overnight trip became a 12-day saga that led to a second trip five days later, five weeks later, not five days, five weeks later, that led to a third trip. During this trial, you will hear from many witnesses. Each will provide information, some one puzzle piece, some lots of the puzzle pieces. You will see many, many photos, <coughs> phone records, airline records, bank records, life insurance policies, charts, maps, clothing, videos. The end of all the evidence, the picture on the box will be clear. Mark Seavers is charged with first degree premeditated murder and conspiracy to commit that murder. As his honor will instruct you, first degree premeditated murder requires death be caused by a criminal act and the killing be premeditated. Mark Seavers is charged as a principal, which means he did not have to be present during the time of the murder. Conspiracy is, it, conspiracy is a second crime. It has two elements, the intent that the murder be committed, and then to cause, confederate with another person to commit or have that murder committed. At the end of this case, his honor will instruct you fully on the law. And the state is confident at the end of this case, when you have considered all of the evidence, when you have listened to the court's instructions, that you will find there is only one true verdict, a verdict that Mark Sievers is guilty of the premeditated, brutal murder of Teresa Sievers and that Mark Seavers is guilty of the conspiracy for that murder to be committed. Thank you.